Well, DJ Leroy. Night Watchman. How you doing, buddy? I'm good. How are you? Not bad. Not bad. Uh, you have a good week? Uh, always, always. It's uh, great. The weather is warming up and um, happy to be alive. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, you're going to be out there continuing to support the small business community, make sure that uh, the restaurants survive during our lifetime, correct? I, I have been doing that. I've been uh, definitely patronizing some of our guests that have been on our previous uh, prior shows and will be on some of our subsequent shows. Okay, okay. Well, you know what, Night Watchman, what about uh, those organizations out there that uh, service our young people? What mm -hmm. about them? I wonder uh, how they're well, doing. I, th I think it's great um, that you put together a great lineup. Um, we've, you, you know, we've been concerned about our kids during this pandemic, and, and they've faced a unique set of challenges. Uh, I mean, I think it's been tough for all of us, but it's de definitely been tough on our youth. And uh, I appreciate uh, the, these brothers that you are bringing on this morning and what they're doing to, uh, to uh, work with our youth. So um, I think you should start the uh, introductions. You know what? I, I think so, too. So uh, first uh, person I'm going to bring up is uh, Reverend Al Cohen. He's the founder and CEO of Jareth Management Group, JMG. He oversees the company's diverse and valuable portfolio of business development services, media production, publications, because remember, he is also an author. That's right. The day that Harlem saved the king, baby. And also uh, marketing and strong brand representation across the entertainment industry. Uh, you know, it's interesting uh, with Al because he definitely has something going on every Wednesday, and he'll get m uh, more into that where he really touches the lives of young people from literally from uh, 12 to 17, seeing that they actually have conversations, conversations that lead to actual action. Ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Al Cohen. What's up, buddy? You're, you're on mute, uh He's coming. Okay. Good evening. Go. So ah. good to be with you guys. All yes. right. All right. Great to have yes. you with us. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, next gentleman coming coming on the show. You know what? I'm telling you, Night Watchman. As soon as you heard what not that there would be lights, camera, action. The brother, he was on it. Okay, big time. And that, of course, has to be the one, the only, Steve Melton. Steve. What's now, up, baby? How you doing there? Good, <laughs> good, good, good. Hello, hello, baby. <laughs> All right. And, and, and you're going to get into more, but literally, I got to say that you have spent your entire professional career at Madison Square. So do tell. You're going to, you're going to get into that, but yes. And Madison then having Square built, Boys and Girls Club. Thank you, Night Watchman. Oh, you so you actually read my notes. I love it. Okay. <laughs> in go, addition, in addition, you're going to talk about your new clubhouse that you have actually planted right there uh, on the uppermost reaches of Central Harlem. Yes, Steve. Fifth Street in Harlem. Yeah, for sure. You got it. You we, got we'll it. We'll give you everything brother. you need to know. We're going to open up the door and let you see everything today. All right. Okay. See, oh, Night right. Watchman, get you ready. Getting it popping here. <laughs> Uh, needless to say, our, our next guest is also a veteran of Soul Lounge Primetime, but he recounts the time that we were actually in uh, the studio, okay? Do you remember that time, Night Watchman? I do, I do. It seems, okay. it seems, <laughs> seems like eons ago. <laughs> yeah, and, and it was. And it uh, was, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Mr. Tony Hillary and Harlem Grown. Hey, hey, hey. How you guys doing? Good, right. my brother. Good. Good to see you guys again. It's you great know? to see you too. Even if we're, it's not in the studio, hey, but we're still going. We're still going to deal with it. You know, that's okay. Uh, so, Night Watchman. Uh, last but not certainly not least, a gentleman who is a veteran. Uh, I, I would say not only a veteran of um, Soul Lounge Prime Time, but also the virtual Soul Lounge Prime Time. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up once again for Mr. Jordan Stockdale. Jordan, what's up, buddy? Uh-oh, you're, you're mute. <laughs> Man, that's the most used phrase of this entire year. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> right. Good evening. 
<laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And so Jordan, not only being the the head out of the mayor's office of the Young Men's Initiative, he's also the brother who set uh, probably Night Watchman straight about where the damn best barbecue is. And it's Kansas City, Missouri. Okay, that's all I'll say. We had, we had other thoughts? <laughs> well, uh, well I, th I think Night Watchman, he might have been trying to throw uh, North Carolina in there. But I'm just saying, well, you know. Look, look uh, <laughs> we're, we're not going to have barbecue wars up in here tonight. We're just going to um, respect all barbecue. All barbecue matters. <laughs> As I say, you can't, you cannot make this at all. Uh, as I say, any any jokes? Because we have been in this lockdown for more than uh, a year and change. Okay, you guys have programs that are vital and essential to touching the lives of young people. Okay, so I I need to know how have you guys been able to adjust with the new uh, paradigm that we've been dealt, uh, Reverend Al. Well, uh, it's it's kind of crazy to me because, uh, like you're saying, the adjustment. You know, um, we started out early talking about how the young people are really suffering during this time, you know, because they have no outlet. You know, they, they have no socialization. And uh, it becomes very critical. And we see the spike in the crime that's taking place in the community and so one of the things that we're doing is providing an outlet for them, you know, during this pandemic, because, you know, a lot of them are being, you know, crowded up in the homes and, you know, they can't go to school, you know, they can't have activities. So we provided and we get into it later in depth, you know, on Wednesday night, which is called tag night for the youth, you know, to give them some type of socialization and outlet and just to even express inwardly, you know, um, from the inside what's taking place, you know, with them as well. Nice, nice. Uh, you know what, Steve, please do tell, because certainly with the new clubhouse that came online, I, I would say a little more than a, uh, over a year, and then suddenly we're in lockdown. How has Madison Square Boys and Girls Club adjusted? Yeah, you know, it's been a difficult adjustment uh, for everyone in Madison Square Boys and Girls Club has been no different. Uh, you know, when, when uh, 12 months ago happened, a year ago, I think we were all a little bit in shock. And, uh, you know, we, we, we learned a new word, and that was called pivot. You know, everybody <laughs> had to pivot. Everybody had to, you know, determine how do you, how do you keep, you know, your passion alive? How do you keep alive those things that you do and you want to continue to do? So, you know, first and foremost was just looking at for our, our staff. You know, we, we have over, you know, 150 individuals that work with young people at Madison Square Boys and Girls Club at six sites around uh, the, the city. And those are five facility-centered buildings that we own and operate. They're full-fledged buildings over 25,000 square feet buildings with pools and gymnasiums and rec rooms mm. and, and dance studios and music studios. And so it was first taking care of our staff and making sure our staff was okay and the families were fine. And after we made that adjustment and, and determined that we had a team to work with, it was the leadership team uh, really sitting down and saying, how are we going to do this? Uh, and then we, we <coughs> learned another word. Pivot was one word we learned. The other word we learned real fast was Zoom. <laughs> so I, I thought Zoom meant something else. And then I had to find out it was a technology that we could use to connect with people. So we learned Zoom very quickly, got to understand that technology, how it worked, uh, and put it into effect. And then we did a survey to find out how many of our over 5,000 young people that we serve in communities from, you know, from the Bronx all the way to, to Harlem, you know, how could we connect with them? Who had the online capabilities and those youngsters that we did connect with, uh, we, you know, we connected up with Zoom and we got online and we connected up with our young people. Those uh, young people that we didn't have Zoom, you know, we were using everything. We went back to snail mail. We went back to knocking on doors, uh, you know, covering our face and have gloves and hat masks on and everything mm. and connecting wow. with our people. And uh, most importantly, our kids who are ages between six to 18 years of old, uh, age and make sure that they were okay. Uh, and that's really how we, we began the process. And so we went from Zoom uh, in March uh, of last year all the way to June. And then we decided we were, we were 
ready to come out the closet, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And so we started opening up our doors in July. We we felt the wow. kids needed to get back out, you know, uh, and and in a safe kind of way. So we took all of the precautions that the state was uh, was advising us. We had to. We opened up our doors, and we opened mm -hmm. up our doors to allow young people to come back in and to reconnect with us. And then we pivoted again because then we heard about food insecurity. And so we had to connect with organizations, you know, as versus City Harvest began to provide food for people. And then the donors called and said, how can we we you know, be supportive? And so other than, of course, sending us a check to make sure we can continue <laughs> to keep the lights on and, and pay the salaries, uh, it was about making sure the food was available for people. And then and then it was about, well, it was not only food, we, we need uh uh, we need PPE. We need those things mm. that you know protect people. So it was gloves and masks and finding hand sanitizer and all those things that were necessary uh, for young people to survive. So we did that and we learned we could do that effectively. And so when the school year uh, came back around in September of last year, uh, we began to work with the DOE and DYC, the Department of Youth and Community Development in the city and Department of Education. And we opened up our doors uh, to be a service to those youngsters that needed to uh, be in school, but for one, whatever reason, they were on a hybrid schedule or they were completely re remote and didn't have the hardware or the connectivity. Uh, and so mm -hmm. we opened up our doors and we allowed those youngsters from eight o'clock in the morning to three o'clock in the afternoon to come in uh, and be the hub to download their school programs, connect with teachers, to use the technology and our internet that we have in our vast programs to really connect uh, with their teachers and their schools to get the education they so needed. But then they stayed with us after three o'clock and we began to provide an evening meal for them and begin to make sure the social emotional activities were there and the recreational activities there so they could have fun. And we want them to let them know that we were here. The families were there being supportive with all the trauma they were going through, but mm -hmm. the Boys and Girls Club would be there as well too, uh, to support them. So we've been continuing that and, and it's looking good. And we hope as we continue uh, to come out this craziness that has been a mm -hmm. pandemic and, mm -hmm. and uh, we follow safe protocols and herd, you know, the herd factor right. gets mm -hmm. in and, and people do whatever they have to do to be safe. We'll begin to get back to some normalcy and have our doors completely open. We have our youngsters using, you know, the vast uh, you know, programs and activities that we provide. Beautiful, beautiful. So I uh, guess you weren't on vacation during the pandemic. <laughs> no, nah, man. They, they, they decided to pull back that, you know. But, uh, so they wouldn't even let me work remotely. They said, nah, that remote thing ain't going to work for you. You need to come in and open up the doors and be supportive. Uh, and you know, it's really good. So I'm sure that, you know, uh, Revan could relate to this, man. It's about a passion and a ministry. And, mm. you know, and, you yeah. know, when, when your people need you, you got to be on the ground. You got to be, be boots on the ground and you got to be there supporting people. It's time for you to sit back and chill out and Netflix and do all that other stuff. <laughs> but the young people, you know, which is so important uh, in, in this city, were calling out for us. They needed us. And I think those organizations, professional organizations and volunteers and support and churches and organizations needed to be there to make sure that, uh, you know, youngsters were there and they got the support they need. And, 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 uh, and, and I'm glad we were able to do it. So we, we, we're going to we're going to hold off on the, on the vacation to Coney Island. And we're going to do that. Uh, you know, we're going to do that later in August, probably, you know. <laughs> that, <laughs> All right. Well, so that well, leads you know, to. Okay. Go ahead. Who, who you going to do, Bob? Well, Tony, obviously, uh, I mean that that yeah. we set him up. I'm pretty sure Tony wasn't on vacation either. Uh, oh, well, man. yeah, because we were wondering about remote growing. Is there such uh, a thing? I don't think so. <laughs> well, first of all, hats off to all you guys, man. You know, you're doing God's work, and this is what's that's what matters. You know, um, you know, this pandemic taught us a lot, not about about ourselves as well, right? So, I thought I was ahead of the curve back in uh, early March when I shut down my office and told my staff to stay home. No one missed a paycheck for a year. Mm. Um, we mm. focused just on our people. But mm. at the same time, don't forget, half the kids in my program are working in, they live in transitional housing. Um, mm. Okay. So all of these kids go to school for their education and their food. So three days after I shut down, the school shut down. Mm. So I'm sitting right here where I'm talking to you right now sheltering in place right it's easy for me and i'm thinking about my kids right and i'm like i give the city credit it usually takes the city a million years to do anything but in two days they came up with the grab and go program 
Mm. Right. Okay. So now the kids had to go to school, but they can pick up three bags of a sandwich, of yogurt, a fruit and milk three times a day. But that's the diet every day. Wow. Two days after wow. that, the parents are deemed essential employees. They have to work. So imagine you're in a domestic violence shelter. You're sitting there. Your mother has to go to work. You you got yo, dude, man. My head exploded. <laughs> so I sat on a panel with uh, JJ Johnson, a field trip. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. And yes. back then, all the restaurants shut down as well. So I reached out to JJ and said, "Hey Jay, if I buy 400 dinners from you, could you bring back your kitchen staff?" And he said, "Yeah." So we did. I delivered it to a shelter across from my office, 400 meals. They were delicious meals, by the way. <laughs> and I posted it online. And from that posting, $180,000 came in from around the world in small donations. The average donation was like $25. We were like the wow. Bernie Sanders of nonprofit. <laughs> so I got all this money coming. I got all these kids. So we went from that one shelter and one restaurant to five restaurants and seven shelters seven days a week. And we gave out, oh, my God, tens of thousands of nutritiously balanced hot dinners. Mm. Um, but also during that time, we kind of looked at ourselves at Harlem Grown. I mean, what are we doing, right? I'm growing the basic lettuces and the cabbage, the kale, the collards, of course. Um, you know, we do what we do on the ground, but we know we could do a lot more. So we had an internal look at ourselves and unanimously as a staff. So we're using our lens of food justice and food access and we're sprinkling in racial and social justice, advocacy, civics, and healthcare. Mm. These are all the things that COVID has shined a bright light on that we've been working in the shadows around this for forever. That's what we do. And mm. it's the reason why we do it is this generational poverty and all these man-made obstacles that put in people's way to keep them right where they are. But COVID kind of pulled the curtain back, right? COVID's not killing anybody. It's all these underlying health conditions, right? The mm -hmm. Mostly diet related, lack of trust in the healthcare system, um, just lack of um, faith in the systems, the pillars of society, man, we don't trust any of them. We shouldn't, <laughs> we shouldn't, right? Mm -hmm. We shouldn't, mm -hmm. we have every reason to be skeptical, right? But we think we have a unique platform where we have these little kids and young parents at the same time that we could try to build a bridge and build that trust up. Um, but I've never been more proud. We open up our farms now. We got them. It seems like business as usual. And even though we're in, I hope we're towards the end of this. I just bought a... Um, a mobile teaching kitchen that would allow us to reach about 800% more of our youth. Wow. So we can go where they are instead of making them come to us. And that should be on the road next month. Um, the middle of June, we should have it on the road. You guys will see it. It's going to be, it's going to be <laughs> wild. <man. laughs> Very nice. Very nice. Are you still doing any uh, tours of your garden there oh. on 128? Dude, that's how I raise my money. I've been doing them all through the pandemic. I do the best socially distanced tour you've ever seen in your life. Man. <laughs> Seven days a week, I'm out there, man. Nice, nice, nice. Jordan, Young Men's Initiative, coming out of the mayor's office. Do tell. I just got to say, first, let's have a, a tremendous amount of respect for everyone on this call and on the show. Um, I, was, I love walking by the Harlem grown sites too, you know, <laughs> you see the greeneries and see the kids and see the food, you know, everything. So I want to thank nice. y'all for doing. So the Young Men's Initiative, we're Office of the Mayor that's explicitly focused on reducing racial disparities and empowering young people. And so when the pandemic hit, we saw our, you know, role as, you know, two or threefold. The first was we got to make sure that there's programming for young people to help them learn in this environment where they're, you know, this blended learning environment. Uh, so we launched the Community Crisis Response Initiative, which was a program that gave out $500,000 to community-based organizations uh, to ensure that they're providing that you know, additional service to young people who are trying learning online, but also need some additional tutoring, additional mentoring, uh, additional social emotional support during these really hard times. So we saw ourselves, one, providing that for the kids, but also sustaining our community-based organizations, knowing that they're the infrastructure of our community uh, and that they were receiving less money from their funders because the pandemic created a fiscal crisis, right? So mm -hmm. all of these issues kind of compounded. Uh, the, the next thing we did is we partnered with the NEON 
uh, neighborhood, uh, neighborhood opportunity networks, uh, there's one in Harlem as well, uh, to provide food to the community. So we provided a week of prepackaged groceries to anyone in the community that wanted to come. And we actually had to shut down the Harlem Neon uh, because of COVID. And we, so we uh, partnered with the Living Redemption Opportunity Hub on 124th and 8th uh, to you know, distribute food. So that's happened you know, for the last year and it's been amazing. I mean, so many people have gone to that to receive uh, free groceries. Um, and so now we're really kind of moving into the next phase, which is reopening. And we're so excited about that. Uh, we're, we're planning some summer programs called the Summer Sizzle. Mm -hmm. uh, I have some summer programming for young people. We're going to do another round of the Community Crisis Response Initiative. Uh, and we have this, this other initiative that we launched uh, last year called Mentors Matter, uh, which was a partnership with 100 Black Men to provide mentoring and tutoring to our young people. It was an expansion of the CUNY Tutor Corps, which pays CUNY students to tutor and mentor slightly younger versions of themselves in DOE. Uh, and so we, we have a, a little bit of announcement that way coming, coming soon. I can't tell everything yet, but I'm very <laughs> about that. Okay, okay. Uh, gentlemen, I, I, I need to know in, in terms of, let's say, uh, what, uh, Reverend Al, you had initially approached my office uh, regarding the book and getting some real traction behind the book. Uh, tell us about that and then what made you kind of think about also this uh, outreach and mentoring to the young people? Was that all part of a one, a one arc or something different? Go ahead. Well, I mean, it's just been like a long life passion of mine, you know, growing up, uh, like our uh, Night Watcher said, you know, don't let Reverend Al take off the collar because I'm sure he got a story. <laughs> you know, we didn't always grow up on the right side of the tracks, you know, mm -hmm. and just growing up, you know, without a father, being the mm -hmm. youngest out of five, you know, I knew the struggle of, you know, young people, you know, making bad decisions, you know, going in the wrong direction. You know, and I wanted to do something about that. You know, I didn't want to use that to become bitter, you know, in life, not having a father, not having, you know, a mentor, but to make it better for others who might have been missing, you know, the same, you know, resources or the same relationships that I desired. And so mm -hmm. even looking at the, um, the project we did when we first approached you, uh, Curtis, with the King Project, you know, when Harlem Saved the King, being able to tell that story, you know, getting the book out, you know, about the demented woman who stabbed Dr. Martin Luther King in 1958 mm -hmm. when he first came to Harlem for his book signing, and just mm -hmm. seeing the passion of Dr. King, even in the midst of what he was fighting for and the opposition that was coming against him, you know, how we are to live a sacrificial life that is really not about us, it's about us being a servant to others. And so mm -hmm. the youth program that we developed called Tag Night, which, is, which stands for teaching a generation, is simply just that, you know, looking at, you know, the community, looking at youth across America and the things that they're going through. And we know fatherless is a part of a lot of their struggles because if you look at the mm. statistics and look at those that are getting in trouble and have been incarcerated or being incarcerated, you can see that they come from single family homes or a lack of fathering or mentoring mm -hmm. in the home, you know, in their life. And so we looked at those things and we were trying to put together you know, different scenarios and different relationships where we can help facilitate the needs and provide the necessary resources and the relationships that we know that these young people need to help them win. And so we mm -hmm. use tag because tag is a label. You know, mm -hmm. you buy clothes, you buy anything, there's a tag on it because that tag yep. gives you the information and gives you, you know, uh, identify what you're purchasing or what you have on and so when we see what society is saying about our generation they labeling them as a dysfunctional generation you know rejected generation you know you name it so we wanted to change that scenario we wanted to change that language so we want to tag them as a generation that's being taught and that's getting mm. the, the tools and the equipment and the resources that they need in order for them to win so they can have a different label. 
you know, and so also when we were kids, you know, back in the days, we used to play that game called Tag, you it. So we realized that the youth generation is next. So it's behooved upon us that we pour in the necessary resources and information as needed because if they're going to be next, our future is in their hands. So we yeah. have to make sure that we give them the tools that they need in order for them to be successful so we can kind of, you know, rest a little bit knowing that we taught them right. You know, we gave them everything that's needed. And the Bible said train up a child in the way that they should go. Because when they get older, they will not depart. Hopefully, mm. now that we've given them certain things that they need, they won't depart from mm -hmm. what they've learned, you know, even when they get in compromising situations. And the thing that's so powerful, Curtis and, and Mr. Watchman, about this Wednesday night that we do call Tag Night is that law enforcement has deemed this to be the place that they come to sit among the youth because what we have done in this also in this setting is also is to provide, you know, a relationship of healing and the walls to be broken down between the youth and law enforcement. And mm -hmm. we, we tell law enforcement that these kids know your authority, but they don't know your humanity. And so ah, on these nights yes. that they come yes. from downtown, they come from the surrounding precinct. I'm telling you, you've seen nothing like this that they share with these kids because we let the kids speak. We call it you speak. And the kids are able to share with them how they feel about law enforcement, what they mm -hmm. think about their community, some talk about what they've gone through in their family. And so the chiefs of uh, the borough, the police, you know, have been coming up, listening, sharing. I mean, any given Wednesday night, you have at least about 25 officers, if not more just to sit there and look. And like I said, we talk, tell the officer, show them your humanity and not your authority. Because now they sit and talk to them about what they might have gone through, to, you know, police profiling when they were young mm -hmm. or even when they are not in their uniform, some of them still get pulled over or profile. Mm -hmm. And the kids need to hear that because they think that the, you know, law enforcement is so distanced from them and mm -hmm. so out of touch with what they go through. But when right. you have officers that has come from the same communities and have been raised from the same background and they're able to show their humanity by mm -hmm. talking about their experience with these young people, it's just bringing healing. And the other week we even had law enforcement sitting at the tables with these kids, giving them their business cards and exchanging wow. numbers with them because a lot of these organizations are out here capitalizing on the fact that the youth don't like the law enforcement officer because it makes it seem like they the big Superman and rescue for the youth so they can justify getting that money. But see, we're not into trying to, you know, discriminate one so we can benefit from the other. We trying to bring the healing through the community you know, with community leaders, law enforcement, and doing whatever is necessary to provide that environment for these kids so they can go on and and really, really, really have a holistic relationship. And you can see them walking out with a sense of pride, with a mm -hmm. sense of renewal, knowing that, first of all, I got a law enforcement officer business card. So if I get in trouble, I got somebody I can call. To hear from the mm -hmm. chief telling them, Here's my cell number. Call me if you need something. Wow. I mean, that's breaking wow. down so many walls, man. It ain't even funny. <laughs> I hear you. Man, oh, man. Uh, Steve, yes, as, as Reverend Al has point, pointed out, we all have our uh, story. We all have yeah, a history. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Do tell yours, <laughs> sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, and, and I wanted to say, uh, Tony mentioned uh, JJ up at, you know, uh, Fieldhouse and... Uh, just real, real, real props to him because he actually called uh, Madison Square Boys and Girls Club and said, look, uh, I know you guys are out there and serving families and I want to be supportive. And he came out there on several days, man, and mm. he cooked up some meals and had it all, you know, uh, perfectly set up and boxed uh. up. And man, I ate well myself that day. Yeah. Baby. <laughs> I, I had my own food insecurity there. He fed us well. So big props out to him and definitely support, you know, the work he's doing at his restaurant as well there too. Uh, nice. You know, hey, look, my background is, is, is like many of us. You know, I, I grew up in Harlem, 
you know, a, a four rambunctious boys. Mm. Dad took the early retirement program and, uh, you know, left mom to you know, do the best she could. And uh, she was a day laborer. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, I got my start early in, in life because I was hanging out with some some guys that maybe I shouldn't have been hanging out with and, <laughs> and had some trauma, man. Found myself with my my face split open, sitting up in the hospital, uh, getting sewn up. And uh, my mother said, I can't I can't do this. And, and uh, lucky enough, she found the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, wow. And she sent me and my brothers to a Boys and Girls Club. And it really was the trajectory to change my life forever, because there I found men uh, and, and women as well, too, who really mentored me, took me under their wing. And, you know, fast for, forward, I was one of the first in my family to go to college. And, mm. you know, uh, nice. and uh, I, nice. I went, when I was in college, did some part time work mentoring at the Boys and Girls Club. And I found my passion. I said, mm. I have mm. to be doing this for the rest of my life. I, I want right. to be a change agent. I want to be able to you know, be able to impact legacy in a way that will make a difference uh, in the community. And so uh, the Madison Square Boys and Girls Club. Uh, was was in the, the the New York City community for 130 years, providing service to boys and girls between the age of 16 and 18 years of age. Uh, and it was a simple premise. Uh, they put these wonderful facilities, you know, in the communities that young mm -hmm. people could attend. And mm -hmm. it required no 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 background check, no no fee. You know, you just came and showed up and said, "I want to be a part of an organized program." And I did that, and it worked. And I saw that it worked. And so I began to do that in New York City. So for the past 40 years, uh, I've been working with the Madison Square Boys and Girls Club in various capacities doing that, reaching out to young people uh, in New York City uh, who may not have all the opportunities that some others have uh, and supporting them in the way to ensure that they become successful adults. And success means being able to achieve those things they want to do, either put them on a track for work, workforce development or put them on a track for college. And in between, make sure they had a place to go after school that really kept them in check and be able to provide the needs they have. So we have these wonderful facilities around New York City. Uh, and I'll talk specifically about the one in Harlem because uh, the board saw fit about five years ago to uh, uh, to develop, uh, 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 and I should say, expand programs. We had we had uh, four existing sites: two in the Bronx uh, and uh, two uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, and the board decided to expand the footprint. And the board had decided that you know Harlem will be it. Nice. Uh, and so five years ago, they entered upon a you know forty million dollar campaign to mm. build a brand new facility on one hundred and fifty fifth Street on Frederick Douglass. And we put it you know uh, there very. In, in, in very strategically because we saw that community did not have services for all those kids, you know, that were up in the polar grounds, housing area and, you know, landlocked up there, didn't have services. Yeah, uh, and yeah. so, you know, the board saw fit to raise the money. We have this beautiful now and you got to come and see it. Uh, uh, if you haven't been up there already, uh, beautiful 50,000 square foot facility. It is everything a young person needs uh, after school to really develop them. I mean, we have a, beautiful high school regulation gym. You know, we are, we have a, a, a rooftop soccer field that, that's lit. Uh, we have dance studios. We have a, a, a music studio second to none. But we also have classrooms. We have educational resource centers. And we have tech rooms as well, too. And we have, you know, a rec rooms where, where kids can you know, play and enjoy themselves. So we really have this space that is a carrot on a stick for young people. They look at this and they say, wow, that's for me. And we say yes, and they come in, and we get you involved in some of those fun kind of things. But then we develop those relationships where we tap you on the, toe, on the shoulder, and we begin to have you think about your future. What happens, no. young man, after middle school? What happens after high school, young lady? You know, what kinds of things you know, can you do? And then we sort of work with them and sort of track them on that future that we all want for all of our children, right? Uh, mm -hmm. To make sure that they're taxpaying citizens so we can get Social Security benefits at the end of the day. Right. We want them nice. all to be involved and do the right things. And that's what we've been doing and, and we'll continue to do. And, you know, we do that with the support of, you know, uh, friends and volunteers and supporters and you know, city agencies that, you know, trust in what we do. Uh, and it really has been uh, a really a passion of mine. Uh, to, to you know, to see the work. And I'll just tell you one little quick story. When we built this facility, 
and I was fortunate enough to be on the, the planning committee there. And I said, well, one of the things, you know, we're not building uh, a, a jailhouse. So it's going to be no bars. <laughs> it's got to be beautiful. Oh, oh, mm-hmm. I, I just don't want to be part of a, a project. And the board mm-hmm. agreed with that. And we went out and found uh, some really top flight um, um, uh, architects and, and mm-hmm. built this wonderful facility. And after it was constructed and we, we put it up, we had an interesting thing that happened that Nobody came at first. <laughs> people were walking past. And we had to put people out in the street. And so we got this beautiful 50,000 square feet facility, everything you need. Why don't you come in? And the community was like, is that for us? We thought that was gentrification. <laughs> we thought that was like for somebody else. We thought there was some million dollar co-ops in there. I said, no, nah, baby, that is yours. This is yours. They said, what? That's great. And then it went crazy, man. People flooded and came in there. And the brother stopped me on the street one day. I was coming out the building around 8 o'clock. It was kind of dark. And he said, I'm going to talk to you, brother. I said, "Uh uh-oh, what's up, baby? uh, I said, what's going on? What what, what, what went wrong? He said, you work in that building? I said, yes, I do. I'm a chief operating officer there. What's happening? He said, I'm going to tell you something. Got up in my face. Before COVID, you know. So he got up in my face. He got in my personal space, you know. No problem. I said, what's up? He said, man. I've been in this community 25 years and we've never had something like that for the community. God bless you, brother. And so I took that as a pat on the back and encouragement, you know, from the gods above that, you know, we got to keep on doing what we're doing. And and that's the work that we continue to do. And and, and it's fun. And not only are we doing that in Harlem, we're doing that in the South Bronx, we're doing it in Fort Greene. And we expanded right before COVID and went into uh, a school site in Brownsville. Because that's an, an area, if you know New York City, that's definitely mm-hmm. an area there's a need. And, and particularly, mm-hmm. we went into a, a school site dealing with teens and bringing some programs in there, too. So we got a great tool uh, belt of programs, too. We got the literacy programs and the educational programs. And, you know, we got these musical music studios. But we got programs that help youngsters with education. So you can, if you're six to seven, eight, nine years old, mom can make sure that you come to the Boys and Girls Club after school and you're going to get a hot meal. You're going to get a snack. But you going to get help with homework as well, too. You're going to get the right kind of support you need in mentoring uh, and, and support in all your schoolwork. If you're a teen and you want to you get into a job, we're going to connect with all the programs to make sure we get you into workforce development. Or if you want to be tracked for college, we have that for you, too. Big on community service. It's about giving back to your community mm-hmm. and making a difference. And we know that the social emotional learning, you know, happens, you know, when you can uh, give beyond yourself. Not always think about you, you know, uh, Reverend Cohen, but also thinking about others. Right? That's part of the gospel, mm-hmm. right? Go out and do something for someone else. Touch the hem of somebody else's garment, so to speak, and make some change. Uh-huh. So those are the kinds of important things we want young people to do and connect. And then the, this is the final thing I'll add. I'm so very proud. And I have a real connection with this. The men and women that we hire to do this work, because mm-hmm. all of us that are involved in non profit, you ain't doing this to get rich. That's why my <laughs> vacations happen in Coney Island, right? <laughs> you know, you're not doing this to get rich. But there's a a higher calling to do the work, and those men and women that we tap and to come on board to do this work, I am so proud of them. As I'm sure Jordan and Tony knows this as well too. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we do. You know, we we do work with people. We're a people organization. We need teams of people that we can work to do this uh, to do this work. And so the 150 men and women that come on board to the Madison Square Boys and Girls Club, big shout out to you folks for the sacrifice that you make every day to change the lives of young people and be the dad they need, the mom they need, the abuela, the tia, you know, the auntie. You know, the mm-hmm. big brother, you know, uh, as, as, as my brother, older brother used to do to me, the punch in the chest you need to get you started, man. To go out there and do that work. Put going out there, boy. I mean, he used to give me a little punch in the chest. He said, like, going out there, man, do that work. You can't do that no more. <laughs> you can't do it no more. Right? You can't, you can't, yeah, you can't. You, you just got to give him a salute. You got to give him a punch. You give him a punch you know? exactly. So right on, brother. Go do your thing. You, know, you got to make sure it's verbal now, right? Yeah. Give him good eye contact, you know. But it's that. <laughs> work that really makes the difference and i'm just so proud of those people who sacrifice their own families and their own work to come in and put the hours in day in to day out to make the changes of young people so shout out to the staff of the madison square boys and girls club 
Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, Tony, you've often been referred to as a, a kind of renaissance guy, and I see that you put in the chat uh, the tour. So, uh, Night Watchman, now you've actually gotten some of the produce from Tony, so you already know the stuff and whatnot. Oh, but, listen, uh, look, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a big fan of Harlem Grown. I'm so glad to see coming on the, out of the other side of this pandemic that, that – you know, because I haven't had contact with Harlem Grown because they've had to, they did have to pull back their operations. But uh, the most important thing they do, because uh, I know Tony's mission is not about growing the food, it's about growing the children. Uh. And so I'm, I'm really pleased to see that that mission has, has not stopped, didn't slow down. And it looks like it picked up some speed in the pandemic. Yes. Uh, I want to, I want to ask these guys. Um, coming where we are now, what do you see the challenges for the youth that you deal with, you know, going, because it looks like we're, we're on the downside of the pandemic, hopefully, even though it may hang around a little lot while longer, but it seems like we have some tools to deal with it, but we still have the economic pandemic. Um, we, we have the social uh, justice pandemic, which is um, we, we, we've solved some of those issues, you know, um, with, with the legalization of marijuana. We no longer have the stop and frisk. You know, 10 years ago, our youths were getting um, arrested en masse for, you know, for having a, 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 a joint in their pocket and going into mm -hmm. the system. Now that's not, a, not an issue, but we still have the issue of, you know, what's next for the, these kids. They've been a year where the education system has has probably failed them in terms of really delivering. So, so what do you, what are you guys seeing on the ground in terms of the challenges and opportunities for the kids that you work with? Who's that anyway. directed to? Take it, Tony. Well, you know, and I'm glad you framed it like that, uh, Bob, because the the problems are, are, are bigger than they were before the pandemic, right? Our kids were already behind and now they lost another year, mm -hmm. right? They came up with this simplified version of, um, of a response of uh, virtual learning. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you learn remotely when you don't have a device or Wi-Fi? <laughs> we had kids yeah. literally trying to do their homework on cell phones, man. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. wow. And then you're isolated from other children. I mean, part of growing up, you need you need socialization, right? You need mm -hmm. to be, yeah. so we're kind of curious on how this is gonna unfold. Um, we've been slowly bringing our kids back, but with COVID restrictions, you know, we used to have a hundred kids in, a, in a, one of our farms and now we have to do 12. That's why I went out and bought the food, uh, the teaching kitchen, so we can go out there. And remember, like you said, Bob, and thank you for remembering, we plant fruits and vegetables, but we grow healthy children in sustainable communities. So mm. don't let the food fool you. That's our vehicle mm. in food justice and food access. Yeah, we grow 6,000 pounds of organic produce. It's all free of charge with cooking demos and stuff, but that's not the work. The work of the people that we grow. I mean, you've seen our, our, our facility on 127th Street. I've spent a million dollars on that site, a million dollars. Wow. And you see the security is a bicycle lock on the gate. We've had no vandalism or theft in that site since it's been erected almost three years ago. Nice. What does that say? You know, the community embraces our work. And, and like um, my man was saying about the guy walking up in his face, when you walk around Harlem with this shirt between 125th and 135th, <laughs> we're stopped every day. Thank you, bro. We love what you're doing. Thank you, man. Nice. And we have a diverse staff, and it's, it's relayed to them as well. Anyone wearing this shirt repping this? I mean, we get the love and that's the, that's the work. And I got a, I got a second that I don't do it myself. I mm -hmm. introduce myself as an accidental founder and an <laughs> accidental executive director. I was never cut out for this. I just started volunteering, saw a problem, wanted to do something and it turned into this 10 years later, right? Mm -hmm. But I stand on the shoulder of my staff. This, these guys, are, yo, I got some people with master's degrees from Ivy League schools that come down here and work for forty thousand dollars a year. Where does wow. that mm. happen? Mm. Yeah. Where yeah. does that happen? Never call out sick. Never late. Rolling up their sleeves, grinding. And mm. yo, I'm telling you, that's the work. Yeah, that's yeah. The work. yeah, yeah. Totally, totally. Jordan, 
uh, tell us about also in terms of uh, what you do with the Young Men's Initiative, also looking for other providers ar across the, the city. How does that work? Yeah, we have a number of different programs. I mean, so I see us as a, a, a vehicle to fund and co-manage different programs across workforce development, so employment programs, um, criminal justice reform, we got a few of those, education, which includes mentoring, which is our biggest thing, and then we have a couple of health programs. Uh, on, the, on the education side, our most popular program is New York City Men Teach, which is designed to increase the number of men of color in the classroom, recognizing there's a disparity between men of color uh, teachers and boys of color in the classroom, right? And you need to be able to see yourself in success to be mm -hmm. successful. And so these young students need to be able to see men of color teachers that they can build with every day, that they can help guide them throughout the class, uh, throughout their schooling uh, and to graduate, you know, to go into college if that's what they want to do. And there's actually good studies that show that black students, this is, this is a fascinating study, black students that have a black teacher in their early grades are actually way more likely to graduate from high school and even more likely to graduate from college. And there's a few different studies on that. And so, and so you know, building upon that, we have a program to address that, that, that disparity. Um, yeah, so I don't know exactly what the question was. I'm just kind of talking about what we're doing. <laughs> But not, yeah. not, what was the question, man? I want to make sure I'm answering. <laughs> Looks like uh, uh, D <laughs> DJ Leroy, are you still with us? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> yes. <laughs> man, oh, man. <laughs> this is what saying, happens when you have <laughs> the new paradigm of COVID. Night Watchman, yep. man, oh man, my power source was about to go. So anyway. Oh, okay, got you, got back. you. Listen, you know, <laughs> as, as, as Brother Steve said, you got to learn to pivot. And you got to have a quick pivot, you know. Hey, you, you gotta, <laughs> hey, Bob, you got to pivot and you got to pay your electric bill. <laughs> God, that is, did not take a break, all right? They still out there, but you got to pay the they, bill, DJ. Man. They are. Man, well, oh man. You know, one thing we learned it, it, over the last year, year and a half is, is, and we knew this already, how resilient we are and have to be, but we really got a chance to see what the boundary uh, boundaries of it were. And um, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm really moved hearing all of your stories because um, nobody on this panel um, dropped, you know, didn't miss a step. You know when 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 the call came and it was time to do something for for the folks who you're working so hard for, um, you, you you guys just you know dug in and kept grinding. And um, I'm I'm yeah. proud of the community of Harlem, Bronx as well. You know I've seen so much activity in terms of people who are active in the community, whether it's getting PP. E out, whether it's been getting meals out, whether it's been working with people, um, you know, mental health. There's so many things that were needed to be done to get us through this thing. And, you know, we all are still going through a grieving process, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we had a whole bunch of people we lost a year ago that we never had funerals for. Um, yeah. And I found myself personally um, having to have conversations this year as we came up on the anniversary of people we lost mm -hmm. and having to have those conversations with friends and loved ones who are still processing it and, yeah. um, and still dealing with different health, health challenges. So um, I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, take this moment to just yeah. uh, share my appreciation. Also, um, uh, Curtis, um, we mentioned uh, uh, Chef JJ from Field yeah. Trip a couple of times. I think we also want to have him on the next uh, show that we do with restaurant owners. Okay, because he has been doing doing the same type of work. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the the challenge of running, uh, uh, keeping your restaurant open, and still finding time to pivot to to just feed the community. Um, that's something that we need to we need to make sure that we give him his shine as well. Yeah, yeah, big big props to JJ. It's great work. And if you haven't been down the field trip yet, check them out. Definitely support him. He's doing great work, and he's not forgetting uh, his mission. 
uh, as right. well, too, to reach out. And like I said, again, he came right to us. He showed up with him and his staff. He didn't send some people there and said, I'm going to send a couple of meals. He showed up himself right. with those meals. And those meals were warm, too. He That's didn't give right. some cold, warmed over meals. No, no. Beautiful. I'm telling you, these are meals you could have as well went and paid $15 somewhere right. and had a place. Right. You know, they were they were really great. Well, too. But, Bob, I'm going to echo something, too. And, 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 and Tony, too, I want to say, I like that shirt, brother. So, you know, you, I send you one of you. I'll do you if you do me. <laughs> All right. You rent me a shirt. I send you a shirt, brother. I rep yours. And you what, rep what's mine. Right? What's what's right. I'm, I'm, I'm like a medium. I'm trying to be in shape. You know, so <laughs> you know, like medium, you know? And this, if it got some stretch, I may do a small. If it got some spandex, you know, uh, I no, may okay. do a small. But you, know, Save, guys, you have no shame. No shame, brother. <laughs> no shame, brother. Just get me, get, get me that shirt. Man, you know, I I'm, I'm gonna send you one. All but to right. go back to that whole question about you know young people and what we're seeing on the ground, what we're seeing, the youngsters got serious trauma yeah. <laughs> that they have to deal with. You talk about the fact that they have lost loved loved ones that they haven't even been able to grieve because, like you said, they couldn't go to a funeral, they right. couldn't see their loved ones and put closure to that. So people just disappeared out their life. And these are people that really cared about them. You know, it, you know. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the black and brown people were were unfairly, you know, hit on this here too. But also a lot of elderly people that they loved and looked up to. That now the abuela, or grandma is not there anymore. Or auntie's not there, and they really trust them. Or uncle is not there, and that really impacts. So they got the trauma. And then, you know, I think you know, Tony and Jordan, someone was mentioning about schools that I'm trying to learn. You know, at home or for cell phone. You're absolutely right, Tony. It's one of the things that we were able to see because when we connected with young people through Zoom, we got to look into their world and we saw what they were operating with, who they were living with, what some of the issues were. So they're dealing with so much trauma. School upended them as well. So we talked about the food insecurity. We talked about loss. We talked about the, the social unrest that happened in this country that they had to see. Black men dying at the hands of law enforcement. All of this stuff was going on, and they're in the middle of this saying, holy cow, do I even have a future behind this? You know, they've never seen a pandemic before, you know, death the way it was, bodies stacked up in the front of funeral parlors and in 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 in, in, in uh, uh, trucks, refrigerated trucks as if, you know, it was just unbelievable. And that's what they're coming out of and trying to learn and grow and think about their future. It's like, hey, I might as well just do whatever. It don't make a damn difference because I ain't going to be here anyway. So I think that's the trauma that we have to get youngsters back and we have to. All of us, I think, you know, whether it's Jordan with the initiative or, you know, Tony or Rev and all of us have a responsible is to get youngsters back to some sense of normalcy. Let them know that it will be all right. There is hope. There is a future that together we can do this, young people. And, you know, whether it's, you know, working, you know, the homegrown or, or, you know, the men's initiative or, 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 or Rev doing things. We all got to get out there and let youngsters know that there is hope because you are our future. <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> if. if we don't have you. There is no future. We need you out there to be live and to be to be impactful and to make a difference and, and to bring along the next generation. So we're seeing a lot of trauma. And so we got to get youngsters back. One of the things that we did was so impactful. We did these things called listening circles where we brought young people in and we did it virtually with those youngsters who connect with their, their cell phones or we issued hardware to some young people. In some cases, we brought them into our facilities and we brought young people and have listening circles. We don't want to talk to you. We just want you to talk. You tell us what's on your mind. You and they just got to yeah, this the, yeah, just to rage a little bit and say, yeah, I'm, I'm mad. I'm upset. I don't know. I'm confused. And that was important to connect and see their humanity and hear other young people. You know, uh, we, you know we saw the young people supporting other young people and saying, I got you, brother. I got you, sister. We're going to do this. This is how it's working for me. And then giving them the resources to get them beyond the school situation, education situation, say, we're going to connect you with a, we're going to get you a laptop. You know, we, we, we're going to get you an iPad. We're going to get you connectivity. You come to the club and get connected. We're going to get you a hot spot. We're going to get you a warm mo mo meal. And so we connect up with JJ. We, we, what do you need? We want to be there for you. And yeah. sometimes, like I said again, it's just 
giving young people hope. You know, as a kid of the 60s and growing up, man, we had people that looked to, we know it was going to be all right. We had the Malcolms, you know, we had the Martins, you know, and the and A. Philip Randall. We had all those brothers yep. we looked at. I got a future, baby, because they told me. And I think we have to be those individuals now and young, let young people know we, we're going to get through this. And we're going to get through this because you got adults. And that's what they need. They need, you know, adults, you know, working with them to say, we got your back. Jump on Tony's back. Jump on Jordan's back. Jump on Reverend Cohen's back. We're going to get you over the finish line, baby. We're going to be right there with you. And I think that's the trauma that we, that we've been seeing on the ground and what we all have to do to really inform young people that we got you. And we're going to get we, we, we're going to get beyond this, all of us together. And we're going to be healthy when we do it. Great oh, remarks. Yeah. Can I, can I yeah, do a sure. segue into that? Yes, you can. Can I do a segue? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and, and based on what Stephen was saying, um, that's why we were able to birth what we have coming up in June, June 16th, which is a Wednesday, the Wednesday before Father uh, um, Father's Weekend. We have a fatherhood conference that we're doing mm -hmm. because being able to see these youth and being able to see these young people you know, going through their trauma and going through um, the situations that they're going through. We know also that if we don't help the parents and find a way to strengthen the parents, that we still gonna have this chaos because it takes a community and it takes a, a village to raise a kid. So what we decided to do was to put together a fatherhood conference, you mm -hmm. know, and we call it fatherhood and parenting through the pandemic. And we have, as our confirmed speaker, we have Matthew Knowles, who's the father of Beyonce and Solange. We have Chief Rodney Harrison, who's the chief of department. And then we have Dr. Jeff Gardia, you know, mm, uh, mm, also. And mm. then we're waiting for our David Banks, you know, to bring the education portion in from the Eagle Academy. And so we feel that it was necessary to do that because some of these men need encouragement. They need direction. They need strength. They need to, you know, work out. If some have the mental health issues, anxiety because of maybe a lack of the job and, and not being able to provide like they need to, whatever the issues are, you know, we wanted to be able to give them a place that they can come share, get information, you know, um, discuss what they need and get the tools, you know, as well to help strengthen their home. Because if they're not strengthened, the home is not going to be strengthened. And we saw, you know, a couple of months ago, a father in Brooklyn who took out his whole family and then turned the gun on himself. We saw, you know, the same situation in Harlem. A stepfather, he beats a 10-year-old little boy to death in the project. So oh, yeah. we can't look at the fact that we just see one component we got to start looking at the holistic aspect of the family. And there ain't no shortage of women program. There's no shortage of help for the females, and we definitely need them. But where's the men? We need to be able to strengthen our brothers and let our brothers know that we are there for you. You know, we care for you. You know, we are here to provide for you just as well. So when the young men is looking, in the community and see these mentors they're supposed to be having and the fathers they're supposed to be looking up to, they can see that they're healthy, you know, that they're yeah. whole, you know, and it can help strengthen these kids. So I want everybody on this call, and I know, you know, Curtis is always down with what we're doing, is to really reach out because this is going to be a powerful, you know, men's conference. You know, we have these panelists and speakers, but we want other men to come and share, you know, if necessary. It's going to be June 16th at the Salvation Army on Lenox Avenue, you know, and um, it's going to be in person, and those that can't make it in person, they're going to have Zoom, you know, as well. So please, let's help our brothers. Let's not just talk about it. Let's be about it, you know, because we're doing it, and the donation is only $10, and that's to really, you know, uh, rid out those that just want to play and just get a ticket and know they might not show up. But it's just a donation of $10. And uh, we're excited because we we ready to do this thing for real. Nice. Nice. Right. Sounds well, good. Well, uh, gentlemen, uh, we're going to be closing it out. So I want you guys to give some cl closing remark and also contact information if someone wants to volunteer with your initiatives. Yeah. Uh, Reverend Al, go ahead. 
Yeah, we're at the Community Initiative of NY, and we're located on 2293 Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard, right near 135th Street. And our phone number for anybody that wants to reach out to us um, is 646-662-1235. That's 646-662-1235. Beautiful, beautiful. Steven. Yes. Uh, www.madisonsquare.org. www.madisonsquare. M A D I S O N S Q U A R E.org. And that will give you all the information you need to know. And, uh, you know, you can find me, you know, Steve Melton at S Melton, S M E L T O N, at madisonsquare.org. If you want to, you know, hit me up on an email and, and shout out. You know, always looking for great people to work, looking for volunteers, looking for a check. If you got that, you know, we'll <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll take all of that uh, as well too. But uh, and we'll our facility, uh, main facility and, and administrative office is at two fifty uh, Bradhurst, uh, right mm -hmm. off of one fifth Street, uh, and uh, you know Frederick Douglass. Come check us out. You know, stop by, say hello. I'm there. Uh, I'm not there today. Uh, but you know, <laughs> generally, I am there. I don't do remote. I'm, I'm there, and so you can walk in, ask to speak to Steve, and I'd give you uh, a tour and uh, let you know more about the organization. Excellent, excellent, Tony. Yeah, we're just <clears throat> simply Harlem Grown. You can Google it. We're on all the social media channels. Everything just Google Harlem Grown, and we pop up. And just please mind, be mindful that everyone, a lot of people. We have our built-in obstacles for ourselves. Oh, I don't know how to plant, and I don't know how to do this. I've never, I never planted anything before this 10 years ago. So it's not about that. Everybody has their unique skill set for who you are as an individual. That's what you bring to Harlem Grown. It's okay. not another farmer or another gardener. We have enough of those. We need people. So please look us up, and I hope to see you on the farm. Beautiful. And you guys here, all you guys, are, oh, whenever you're available, hit me up. I put my email in the chat. I would love to give you a personal tour anytime you guys are available. Excellent. excellent. Also, by the way, I'm uh, extra large. Extra large, just so you know. Oh, you get out of here, man. <laughs> Don't jump up on my here. thing now, man. Why you got to take my thing, see, see, right? see. <laughs> so, Medium, Jordan. Tony. Medium. Medium. I got you. I got you, brother. And, and Jordan, do you have any mer mer merchandise yet or not? Not yet. <laughs> we, got, we have T-shirts that we're going to have that we'll pass out at our summer events. we got okay. masks on the way, so we got some merch, too. You said you medium, right? It's medium. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> medium, George. That's medium, George. Medium. <laughs> oh, gotcha. I think DJ Leroy may be extra large, but that, that ain't not oh. my business, though. <laughs> <laughs> Need to get on that bike. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, see, no, I'm going to get you. I'm gonna get. Anyway, George, go ahead. Give us some. So, take us home. Yeah, we're on social media, NYC Young Men. Also, nyc.gov slash YMI. Uh, also, YMI at cityhall.nyc.gov is our email. Uh, sign up for our newsletter. We're constantly putting out the different programs or different funding opportunities, uh, different events that we have. So please sign up for that. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Night Watchman, take us home. It's Soul Lounge Primetime live on WHCR 90.3 FM, 7 o'clock on Mondays and 8 o'clock. We are live on our Soul Lounge primetime channel on YouTube. Thank you, gentlemen, for all yes. you do. Um, come check us out, and we'll be here next week. Same time, same bat time, same bat <laughs> channel. <laughs> gentlemen, right. thank you so much, guys.